for all coming, and thank you for the, to the seminary co-op for providing this venue um, to to promote my book and to just talk about the con. Um, so um, usually, usually when I do these talks, I kind of give I just kind of go over the basics um, of the con's thought. He's kind of one of these difficult French intellectuals, and so. Uh, it takes a lot of elbow grease, as he would put it, to get to get into his concepts and to um, you know get what he's talking about. I'm gonna kind of not do that today. I'm just gonna jump into the deep end, just because I want to. And I figure <laughs> it's Hyde Park. People are smart, um, but uh, it's okay. I think I'm I'm pretty good at um, making Lacan clear. All the reviews have said, well, it's very it's a very well written book. And sometimes I'm like, well, either that means I'm a I'm a good clear writer, or I've just committed the sin of, of simplifying the thought of a great man. Because <laughs> if you read Lacan, it often does not feel like it's very clear. Um, but I'm going to try to be clear, and I'm going to uh, touch on a lot of different things, hopefully not too many. Um, we'll see. The title of the talk today, which I didn't do good advertising, is actually, Are We Still Living in the Age of Anxiety? So the subject for this talk has percolated over the last six months or so, mainly through serendipitous connections between the books I happen to be teaching and reading at the same time. I re recently got my hands on Lacan's seminar an on anxiety, which he gave um, in 1962 and 1963, but which was just translated into English last year. And I ended up reading it at the same time that I was going through Paul Tillich's most well-known text, The Courage to Be which concerns different historical types of anxiety. I also happen to be teaching a tutorial on Hannah Arendt at Scheimer College, which is just down the street um, where I work. And though I have for a long time been enamored of Arendt's thought, I never made connections between her and Lacan until just recently. Um, and I have to say, you know, some of these connections are more like sparks than strong, <laughs> um, strong connections. And I hope it's just illuminating in terms of um, you know, taking one thing that's very di distant from another thing and seeing if we can't think about things a little differently. Um, so I realize that tackling these three major thinkers in an hour or 45 minutes here is a little foolhardy. Um, but a rule of thumb I have when I'm being foolhardy is to just push all the way into foolish. <laughs> and so I'm going to do that by starting to talk about um, Tom Cruise and his latest film. <laughs> uh, which is just sort of be a, a little framing device here to get into <clears throat> Lacan and anxiety. So film directors love killing off Tom Cruise. If you've seen enough Tom Cruise movies, you might have noticed this. Um, they love disfiguring him, setting him on fire, blowing him up. The latest Tom Cruise killing movie is called Edge of Tomorrow, and it really takes the Cruise killing up a notch. The character played by Cruise, Major William Cage, dies at least a hundred times. Unfortunately, we don't get to see all of them. Um, <laughs> And I will be indulging in some spoilers here for those of you who haven't seen the film, but it doesn't matter because it's a bad film and you shouldn't see it. Um, spend your time and money on something else, like you know, a book or something. Um, well, actually, it's good for about five minutes, and that's, that's the part I want to talk about. Um, our theme for today is anxiety, and we typically, typically think of anxiety in psychological or psychoanalytical terms, or today in terms of pharmacology. Um, we think of panic attacks, crippling depression, and the drugs we take to combat them. But anxiety can also be thought of in existential terms. This is where Tillich will take us. It can also be approached with the concepts of political philosophy and political thought, which is where a rent will come in. Movies and other pop culture artifacts often give us pretty good representations of our common anxiety, anxiety as it exists in the social order. And often enough, although I guess this is unfortunate, the worse the movie, the more it relies on the cliches of its genre, the better a window it is into our collective condition. So briefly, this film, Edge of Tomorrow, is set some point in the future during an alien attack. The whole fight is weirdly mapped onto a mixture of World War I and II, but it's more or less the storming of the beach at Normandy. Uh, we're clearly meant to experience the mimics, and that's what they call the aliens, um, as Nazis. They don't speak German, they mostly hiss, but they're Nazis. <laughs> and most of the film takes place during one day which gets repeated ad nauseum, in which the Federated Anglo-American forces storm the mimic's position on a French beach. 
Um, Cruz plays an American PR guy, this Major Cage, who against his will gets thrown into the front lines of the battle and immediately gets crunched up by one of the aliens. <laughs> Upon dying, though, he is returned to the beginning of that day, which he has to live over until he dies again. Reset, repeat, wake up, die. As enjoyable as it is to see Tom Cruise die <laughs> in increasingly, increasingly creative ways, um, even more enjoyable, I think, is the fantasy of seeing ourselves in his position and given a day that we can repeat over and over until we get it right. Um, this conceit, of course, is not new. It's, it's done much better in uh, Groundhog Day yeah. with Bill Murray. And I'll get back to, the, to that uh, later. <laughs> but part of what makes Edge of Tomorrow, even the title is really just horrible, Edge of Tomorrow, bad in its is its unoriginality. It simply moves the plot of that film, Groundhog Day, onto the battlefield. And yet, for the psychoanalyst, the question is, why should we so desire to repeat the same thing? Uh, this thought was the, uh, the impetus for Freud thinking about the death drive. Um, why should we repeat the exact same thing? Why would studios pay millions, uh, moviegoers pay millions, to experience the same old thing? Well, the psychoanalytic answer to this question always involves a fantasy. What fantasy is being enacted that is so pleasurable we enjoy it instead of the movie? The fundamental fantasy in Edge of Tomorrow is that we could die and yet live. That we could take what we need from death, learn the lesson it has for us, and yet go on to live another day. When religious traditions picture the afterlife as a mere continuation of things we liked in this life, it is the same fantasy being invoked. Endless progress. Cruz's character goes from being an inept and cowardly accidental soldier to a fighting machine. And yes, there is that, you know, look how good I'm getting montage with the appropriate uh, music. Every time he's killed, he learns something that he never could have learned otherwise. At a certain point, he meets a woman who trains him and who periodically kills him off so they can start the lesson over. These death scenes have a comedic element to them, which makes it clear that dying is enjoyable. Not only for, the, not only for us watching, but for also for the characters. Uh, because what was unknown has now become known. They have nothing to fear in death. He's conquered death and can die as confidently as a mystic, who because uh, they have tasted of the fruit of eternity, have no other desire but to travel to its source. Eventually, Cruz learns that he has acquired his powers because the first time he died, it was at the hands of an alpha mimic who sprayed some of its blood on our handsome hero. Really messed him up pretty bad. Not as bad as in Vanilla Sky, but pretty bad. <laughs> and in so doing, shared some of his time-warping powers with him. So the mimics essentially are able to control time. Uh, problem is, the mimics know that this has happened and are now hunting for Major Cage. The woman who trains this Cruz character also had this happen to her, but she lost her powers when her life was tragically saved one day on the battlefield by a blood transfusion. Yet before this happened, she started to have visions of the Omega. Yes, Alpha and Omega, there's a sort of lack of creativity here. Um, but the, the Omega is the central brain of the mimic, which um, if it's taken out, you know, the whole enemy collapses. Um, and this is exactly what happens at the end of the movie. Again, a spoiler, but again, save your money. Um, but outside of a few comical death scenes, we still haven't gotten to what is good in the movie. Namely, when Cruz's character suffers the same fate as his trainer slash love interest, and yes, it's a love interest, of course. Um, he too gets saved before he can die, given someone else's blood, and now has only one life to live. And despite the fact that the comforting fantasy of control over death sort of having our death and eating it too, is gone, one gets, for just the briefest moment, a breath of freedom. Death is real. He will die. He only has one chance to save the world, and he's really not prepared. <coughs> Therefore, along with his freedom comes a palpable anxiety, which plays a part in giving his actions a real meaning because they are not determined already, because he hasn't rehearsed for this moment. So even though we really enjoy the fantasy of living forever, the lifting of the fantasy is a breath of freedom that is uh, more real in its enjoyment. Freedom, anxiety, the real are quilted together at this moment. Of course, very quickly, all the old sci-fi, action movie cliches move in, and everything becomes even more predetermined than it was earlier. Of course he won't die. Of course he'll get the girl. 
Of course, the Omega hiding in a parking garage beneath the Louvre, which is apparently one of the two or three places you can hide something important <laughs> in one of these, you know, blockbusters. Uh, it will be destroyed and humanity saved. The worst moment in the film arrives right at the end when, breaking its its own already shaky logic, um, the film resurrects Cruz one final time for no other reason than to win the girl without having, ever having to do any work. We fade to black on the smarmy grin we all know and hate. <laughs> but having already killed the man countless times, when it really comes time to finish him off once and for all, they let him live to get a girl he doesn't deserve. <laughs> Why is the best part of the movie, though, the moment at which the enjoyable fantasy is lifted? The moment in which death becomes real again? Lacan will help us answer that, but before we get to Lacan, we're going to talk a little bit about Paul Tillich and his analysis of anxiety. So I realize that uh, two of the people I'm talking about today, Tillich and uh, Arendt, both taught in Chicago at some point. Um, I don't believe Lacan ever did. He did visit the States, but stayed on the East Coast. <clears throat> Tillich, uh, Paul Tillich was a German Lutheran theologian born in 1886 who immigrated to the States at the age of 47. His 1952 book, The Courage to Be, has become one of, if not the most popular text written by a theologian in the last century, of the last century. Tillich addresses himself in this text to an audience living in the age of anxiety. He borrows the phrase uh, from the title of a W.H. Auden poem published in 1947. This poem also was the inspiration of a Leonard Bernstein symphony, as well as a uh, Jerome Robbins ballet. Intellectuals of the day seem to agree that indeed they were living in the age of anxiety. Tillich simply assumes the truth of the statement, and um, judging by the popularity of his text, so did a lot of other people. Tillich accepts the typical definition of anxiety that we see um, in people like Freud and Sartre, and it seems to be sort of generally just out there that while fear has an object, anxiety does not. And while there does seem to be a focal point to anxiety in that day, namely the atomic bomb, because the bomb is so utterly overpowering, absolute annihilation at the touch of a button that you probably don't even see coming, it almost exceeds the bounds of a typical object that one could fear. While I might fear a gun pointed at me, my only response to a nuclear warhead in some undisclosed location but ready to drop um, in a couple seconds is anxiety. One minute, a nice sunny spring day, the next you're incinerated. Uh, while the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Chernobyl and Fukushima had very concrete experiences with the effects of nuclear disasters, for the vast majority of people there was something very abstract about the atomic threat. It was not something one faced in daily life and yet, should the mind turn towards it, the enormity of the disaster that was really at the height of the Cold War, just minutes away, was enough to constrict the heart, narrow the breathing passages, take the breath away, in short, anxiety. Tillich actually talks about three different kinds of anxiety, each arising most acutely at the end of an age. The first is the anxiety of fate and death, as he says. For Tillich, this anxiety is most strongly marked in the ancient world, and the most effective response was provided by the Stoics. To embrace one's fate, to embrace the inevitability of death, even to the point of suicide, was courage in the face of death. This is courage to be oneself in the face of one's own dissolution at the hands of fate and death. So Tillich talks about courage to be oneself and courage to be apart. With the rise of Christianity, the anxiety of fate and death slips into the background to make way for a different kind of anxiety, that of guilt and sin. Just as the ancient person was anxious over the fact that all must die, the Christian was anxious over the fact that all have sinned, that all are guilty before a just God. The courage that faces up to this anxiety is the courage to be a part, specifically a part of the corporate body of the church. By participating in the church, one can be assured that however sinful one is personally, the bridegroom Christ will not reject his, uh, his bride, the church. The anxiety of sin and guilt came to a head in the Protestant Reformation. This is the end of the age, the end of the medieval age. As the medieval church was being splintered, and was answered, according to Tillich, by the courage of Luther and others, who, 
while founding new churches to replace those they had broken from, also experienced, perhaps for the first time in our history, the despair that goes along with this courage. A despair that makes us feel that none of it really matters. That all the energy we put into the institutions meant to save us, meant to redeem us, or perhaps also irre irremediably, irredeemably tainted by the same frailty as those people um, that have made them. Which brings us to the third type of anxiety that, according to Tillich, marks most acutely the modern age. I mentioned that for Tillich, each form of anxiety comes to a head at the end of an age. And though some might say that modernity is coming to an end at some point between Kierkegaard and Sartre, the very name of the age that follows the modern one, namely postmodernity, seems anxiety-ridden. Are we modern? Are we postmodern? How can one really be beyond uh, the time or the now, which is what modern means? I would venture to say that the reason anxiety has been the affect of the age for so many years is that we've been stuck at the end of modernity for a great while, and there does not seem to be a clear way to make the cut final. Samuel Johnson said that a modern person is just someone who's made a clean break with the ancient world. I would argue that such a goal is pointless and counterproductive, that to be truly modern is to be truly grounded in our classics, to be as ancient as we can. To be truly modern would be to no longer have anxiety about the age to come or what it will be called. But the important contribution of the Protestant founders to the treatment of anxiety leads, in a way, to the third crisis, that of the modern era. This is, according to Tillich, existential anxiety, the anxiety of meaninglessness. And of course, he's relying on the work of people like Sartre. In this age, the anxiety of a Luther or a Calvin, that the churches they built will be contaminated by the sinfulness of their builders, has infected every thinking person, and concerns not just the validity of this church or that church, but the meaningfulness of any human activity. Tillich describes this modern anxiety in the following way. The anxiety of emptiness is aroused by the threat of non-being to the special contents of the spiritual life. A belief breaks down through external events or inner processes. One is cut off from creative participation in a sphere of culture. One feels frustrated about something which one had passionately affirmed. One is driven uh, to devotion to one object or, or another and again on to another because the meaning of each of them vanishes and the creative eros is transformed into indifference or aversion. Everything is tried and nothing satisfies. Tillich finds the answer to this type of anxiety in existentialist thinkers from Kierkegaard to Sartre. Namely, that to affirm the meaninglessness of life is not without meaning. That to be able to affirm means that there is something in life that is meaningful from which to despair at the meaninglessness of it all. Now, if this sounds a bit Cartesian or just sort of like mental gymnastics, I think Tillich felt that as well. And he admitted that just as the medieval um, courage to be as a part results in the loss of the self, the existentialist courage to be as oneself can result in the loss of the world. The only way to save both self and world for Tillich would be an act of faith. He is a theologian. Not in the God of theism, but as he says, in the God above God. That is, the world and I are still essentially meaningless. There is no corporate body that by participating in I can assuage my existential angst. There is not even a traditional deity that could provide relief. There is only the faith that there is a meaningful ability to affirm the meaninglessness we see around us. It's even hard to say. <laughs> and this comes not from me, but from a hidden and obscure point that we call God. In Tillich's words, meaninglessness as long as it is experienced, includes an experience of the power of acceptance. To accept this power of acceptance, consciously, is the religious answer of absolute <coughs> faith, of a faith which has been deprived by doubt of any concrete content, which nevertheless is faith and the source of the most paradoxical manifestations of the courage to be. And then, in the last uh, sentence of the book, oft quoted, the courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. So, as helpful as Tillich has been in emphasizing the importance of anxiety for our age and for the ages preceding and making these connections, historical connections, 
I find the sort of redoubled abstraction of his language problematic. Accepting meaninglessness, he says, is in itself a meaningful act. But how do I know that I've accepted meaninglessness? Isn't it possible that I'm quite skilled at fooling myself into thinking that I've seen to the depths of the meaninglessness of my situation when in fact I'm just engaging in a well-worn fantasy that makes me feel uh, that I've earned some sort of existentialist street cred? And here's where I think psychoanalysis provides a necessary corrective to Tillich's thought on anxiety, which, powerful enough from a philosophical perspective and from a historical perspective, simply cannot do what it wants to do, I think, at a pastoral level, which is help people. Lacan would agree with Tillich at the level of theory. Yes, one cannot get over meaninglessness and its attendant anxiety. It's part and parcel of our state. And of course, many of us would agree with this as well. But in its abstraction, it's quite empty. Psychoanalysis demands that one earn the right to such a statement, that one arrives at it through a, a struggle with one's history and one's retelling of that history in the analytic situation. Freud quickly learned how ineffective it was to simply inform people as to the nature of their malady. For neurotics, and for obsessives especially, this only fed their fantastical image of themselves as self-knowing as ones who could heal themselves in an intellectual way, detaching affect from signifier. Um, I think a good way to get at this is uh, an early description Lacan gives of psychoanalysis and its cure, when he still believed it could provide a cure. He said, when you first come in, uh, you talk to me, but not about yourself. And then you start, ta and then you start um, talking about yourself, but not to me, sort of as the analyst. At the end, you can talk to me about yourself. Um, did I say that right? The first one? Okay. Um, felt like I redoubled it. Um, so in other words, the words in the beginning are detached from the affect. And there's perhaps, perhaps an address at some point to the analyst, but only with a, a sort of a wall of emotion and affect. At some point, they have to come together. One story has to be filled with the, uh, the emotions which sort, of, uh, which sort of were there at the original traumatic event. Um, at one point, Tillich remarks that the demoniacs in the New Testament were often aroused to a state of great anxiety by the presence of Jesus. Often they are depicted as the only ones who know the truth about Jesus, and they just want him to leave. The conclusion I draw from this, and this is my, uh, my conclusion, not necessarily Tillich's, yet I think it can serve as a bridge between Tillich and Lacan, is that from what we might call a mythological perspective, ontological anxiety in our tradition results from God's horrifying closeness to us. God's continual offer to love and be loved. This is what horrifies the demoniacs. In Lacan's words, there is only one command in the Bible, and that command is simply jouir, enjoy. It is this command, not anything about sexual practices or food rules, that inspires the greatest anxiety for Lacan. Now, whether we agree with him or not, uh, you can't deny that the first command in the Hebrew Bible is a, a thou shalt, not a thou shalt not. Right? Thou shalt be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. In my book, um, my book I give the example of um, sort of... Um, the problems of being told that uh, enjoyment is off limits versus the problems of being told to go enjoy. So traditionally, the college student would be told, watch out for enjoyment, watch out for girls and drink and parties, get down to studying. Now, I think you know, the college student, but really all of us, are told, enjoy. Whatever you're doing, get maximum enjoyment out of it. And if we don't win that enjoyment, that's where we feel guilty. Of course, there is some of that old guilt that we feel guilty for not studying, but I think we feel more guilty when we don't party, when we don't enjoy ourselves. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the sort of Lacanian's, Lacan's insight, I think, into um, prohibition and how it really works. Um, so the perpetual freedom to say yes to God, to enjoy God, is an anxiety-inducing closeness. One cannot be free of the love of God, and this is simply terrifying. Uh, the traditional Christian notion of hell would also support this, 
in that it is not the absence of God which makes hell hell, but precisely the love of God when it is rejected. This would seem to be at the root of Tillich's existential anxiety. Whereas suicide can take away the threat of death, and participation the threat of condemnation, there is no yes or no, no act that can take away the freedom to love God, to say yes once again, or to say no once again. And the lack of emphasis, theologically speaking, on heaven and hell in the modern period, at least in the last couple centuries, uh, speaks to this sense of infinite choice. It's not that we no longer believe in heaven or hell, but that we no longer believe that death is the end of one's freedom to choose either heaven or hell. So let's finally get to Lacan here. But first, another detour. Because to get to Lacan, we always have to go through Freud, who is the master. And according to Freud, it is death which stands at the center of our psychic economy. Freud took the power of what he called the death drive so seriously that he wondered at the end of civilization and his discontents whether or not its advers adversary, Eros, or essentially the life force, would be able to mount a comeback. I quote the final paragraph of that text at length. I think it's very relevant to our topic. And these are famous lines which some of you probably recognize. He says, The fateful question for the human species seems to be whether and to what extent their cultural development will succeed in mastering the disturbance of the communal life by the human instinct of aggression and self-destruction. It may be that in this respect precisely the present time deserves a special interest. Men have gained control over the forces of nature to such an extent that with their help they would have no difficulty in exterminating one another to the last man. They know this, and hence comes a large part of their current unrest, their ha unhappiness, and their mood of anxiety. And now it is to be expected that the other of the two heavenly powers, eternal Eros, will make an effort to assert himself in the struggle with his equally immortal adversary. But who can foresee with what success and with what result? Lacan, too, though he theorized it differently, puts death at the center of the psychic knot, what he calls the Borromean knot, and which you can see uh, in the handout. So, you know, this is the point at which I would usually explain the Borromean knot, the symbolic, the imaginary, the real. Uh, I'm kind of skipping it and just asking you to focus on the little A in the middle of the knot. He calls it objet petit A. He asks that it wouldn't ever be translated. Um, and I just refer to it as objet a. Um, and, I, and I won't go into sort of why it's called that. Forgive me, it would just take too long. Um, but it's pretty interesting. So um, this, this uh, video is actually, this lecture is being recorded. And if you want sort of the background to this, uh, the a lecture that I gave at Scheimer College just uh, a few weeks ago kind of fills in. It's all about the Borromean and not. Um, Lacan first formulated his, no his notion of objet petit a, or objet a, as part of his math theme of the fantasy. Math theme is his attempt to get sort of mathy. He takes it from uh, Claude Levi Strauss's mytheme, but it's a, an attempt to put his teaching in a form that can be transmitted without, um, uh, what did he say, uh, uh, distortion. So objet petit a is part of the math theme of the fantasy. The split subject, which is the S with the line through it, that relates to objet a. And he uses this lozenge or this diamond-shaped thing to talk about um, different forms of relation. Again, I won't get into that. Um, we'll just consider it as some relation to objet a, but it's, it's complicated, <laughs> um, as relationships are. Um, objet a can take on different forms in the fantasy. There's more or less a form of objet a for each drive. Some of them borrow from Freud. Uh, but I'd like to just discuss what Lacan calls the primal form of objet a, that of the breast. This is the object of the oral drive. We have infants here, so I'm sure they'll relate. Um, which is developmentally the first drive that engages the infant. The breast as, object, uh, as, the breast as objet a is not that which satisfies the oral drive. Well. Obviously, an infant is satisfied by the breast, but in terms of desire, it is the breast as the object cause of desire, the object which causes but do, does not satisfy desire. So Lacan talks about need as something that can be satisfied, 
but as desire as something that is properly endless, although the fantasy always wants to close off desire, and that's the danger of the fantasy. Um, the breast as an object, not of need, for needs can be satisfied, but of desire which can't. Um, that's the way in which the breast functions as objet a, as the primal objet a. Lacan says lots of things about objet a, but one thing he says is that it falls away. Objet a, this cause of desire at the center of the psyche, is always a lost object. And the breast is the primordial lost object for all of us. Um, over the last few months, I, I've been telling the story of Jack and the Beanstalk because we have a two-year-old as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you tell it every night, you get pretty familiar with it, or at least, you know, your own version of it. <laughs> um, but it struck me that it's, it's simply the story of, of the breast as objet a. So the cow, which provides milk to Jack and his mother, stops providing milk. No reason why, but it stops, and so it's gotten rid of. And what takes its place is a duality. Objet a drops away, you get a cleavage, you get duality. Five golden coins, which of course is what he's supposed to get, versus five supposedly worthless beans, which of course, because he's a dunce, he gets. The fall of objet a always results in the splitting of the drive into its erotic side, the object as value, the gold, and its aggressive side, the object as spurned, or these beans that the mother reacts to violently and sends, you know, Jack to bed without his supper. The spurned beans are discarded onto the trash heap, but the next morning they've grown into a ladder to the skies, this um, beanstalk, to the land of the giants. Jack goes there, steals various precious objects, slays the giant, and returns with an object that has the power to nourish him and his mother endlessly. The nourishing breast, which was taken away at the beginning, is returned in a new and better form at the end. In Stephen Sondheim's version of the story, which we see in his musical, now film, Into the Woods, um, it is clear that the breast has become an object of desire. It's gone from being an object of need, which it was as the cow, it provides the necessary food, into an object of desire, because um, in, in, uh, when Jack goes up to the land of the giants, he has sort of this obscure sexual attraction to the, um, to the giant's wife, who takes, her, uh, takes him to her breast. And the audience sort of giggles nervously. They're not quite sure what's happening to the fairy tale. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think from a psychoanalytic point of view, it's, it's accurate. The, um, <clears throat> it actually involves a nice complication, right? Whereas the, fan, uh, the fairy tale is much too closed. You simply get the breast in a better state, right? It just uh, magically supplies food till the end of time. Um, what we should be talking about is a transition from need to desire something that can't be simply closed off and satisfied. So the, ab the affect that Lacan links to objet a is anxiety. He says, wherever objet a arises, so does anxiety. Um, strangely enough, though, anxiety does not arise because the object is lost, but because the object of desire does not leave the subject any breathing room. And I think this is really his insight here and where he goes apart from uh, till it goes beyond it. When the milk goes dry, Jack might experience fear or hunger, but it is only when the maternal object represented in the giants and perhaps in the breasts of the giantess that we come up against anxiety. It is only in the maternal object that we come up against anxiety. Anxiety arises when there is a lack of lack. This only makes sense if we realize that for Lacan, it is desire which is ontologically for humans most important. And if my object of desire leaves me no space, satisfies me too well, that means I have nothing to desire. My desire dries up. And thus, my very subjectivity is in danger. For Lacan, the result of not giving a child room to desire, of satisfying desires too well, is actually psychosis, where because the incipient subject was never able to win any breathing room to work out her own desire, subjectivity never occurred, never developed. Um, Lacan talks about neurotics, psychotics, and perverts. Um, we're mostly talking about neurotics today, um, but I just sort of put that out there um, because some of the things I say about anxiety will be different if you're talking about um, the different kinds of um, human subjects. But for neurotic subjects, working through the fundamental fantasy is the whole point of analysis, or at least one way to look at what the point of analysis is. 
Analysis says Lacan should exhaust demands. Um, so both desire and, anxi desire and anxiety can be experienced in a real way, a way not completely constrained by the limits of the fantasy. While the fantasy reveals objet a in the mathem there, uh, reveals the object of loss and desire around which the psychic econ economy is based, it also squelches that desire, covers up the anxiety by providing a phantasmatic, uh, answer, phantasmatic answer to desire. In Jack and the Beanstalk, <clears throat> the fundamental fantasy centers around the loss of the maternal breast as the cow and its transformation into the goose that lays the golden egg perpetual source of dependable nourishment, one that can't be taken away if I'm bad or if I grow up. So while on the one hand, the story can be read as a helpful parable of weaning, yes, the breast is gone, but you will find other ways to satisfy your hunger, it, is also dangerously, uh, it also dangerously pretends that the object of desire could ever be as dependable as an object of need. The infant experiences hunger, cries, and hopefully is given the object of its oral need. The adult the subject experiences desires and mistakes it for need and fantasizes that there is some object that could plug up the whole of desire. Here we see that Lacan's approach to anxiety is in a way similar to that of Tilly. Anxiety is part and parcel of the human experience and one should not attempt to get over it. Instead, one works with it. What is refreshing about Lacan is that he is very concrete in the manner one works with one's fantasy or as he sometimes says, one symptom. While there are general guidelines, ultimately one can only address pathological anxiety via the talking cure. Psychoanalysis, because, uh, which is psychoanalysis, because our symptoms arise out of our history and we can only address them by talking, by telling our story of ourselves, by telling it, by telling it better. Um, I want to move now to discussing anxiety from the perspective of political philosophy, uh, but not forgetting these points, um, especially concerning Lacan. Um, for while, while it's true that pathological anxiety is best addressed one-on-one -on -one in a psychoanalytic situation, it is also true that our personal stories participate in our collective ones. And my goal here, like I mentioned before, is not to be prescriptive, but to kind of uh, create a spark between these two figures that are admittedly very far apart, Lacan and Arendt. So Arendt. Um, her first major publication was The Origins of Totalitarianism, written in 1950, um, in which she traces the rise of 20th century totalitarianism as seen in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. One can understand the rest of her career as an attempt to articulate an alternative to these regimes <coughs> and a al conceptual alt alternative um, as well. In her 1962 book, On Revolution, she gives this alternative to us. And for her, it's the revolutionary political experience in the United States or what was to become the United States prior to um, 1776. This era is for her an untheorized or faultily theorized era, one which has been overshadowed by the brilliant analysis and theory lavished on to the French Revolution. What I'd like to focus on in her analysis of totalitarian regimes is the way in which these regimes, you know, in her telling, manage, create, and control anxiety. They squeeze men and women into a mass, taking away the public space in which one always has a certain distance from one's neighbor, a certain freedom of movement. Arendt constantly uses the language of anxiety, which etymologically does refer to a tightening and to a squeezing. And she says, and I'll quote at length here, um, that these regimes fit the subject into the iron band of terror even when he is alone. Totalitarian domination tries never to leave him alone, except in the extreme situation of solitary confinement. By destroying all space between men and pressing men against each other, even the productive potentialities of isolation are annihilated. By teaching and glorifying the logical reasoning of loneliness, where man knows that he will be utterly lost if he ever lets go of the first premise from which the whole process is being started. Even the slim chances that loneliness be, may be transformed into solitude and logic into thought 
are obliterated. And I'm still quoting here. If this practice is compared with that of tyranny, it seems as if a way has been found to set the desert itself in motion, to let loose a sandstorm that could cover all parts of the inhabited earth. End quote. Now this first premise that uh, Arendt mentions concerns the ideological nature of totalitarian governments. Uh, that all thought and all action are tied to one basic idea that must be followed rigorously to the end. But these ideas are clearly more fantastical than logical, the Lacanian point. They are simply fantasies which must be followed with the rigor of logic. In Nazism, uh, the fantasy of getting rid of all the Jews in Europe to usher in a kingdom of 1,000 years of peace is enlarged and emphasized to such a degree that common sense almost drops out completely. No one, or almost no one, stops to wonder how it is that an idea whose conclusion is peace, whose rhetoric is even peace, could demand such an unprecedented violence. In fact, the contradiction becomes another proof of the idea. Of course, an unprecedented peace demands a violence heretofore unseen. The ideas behind ideologies always baffle common sense and allow their proponents to get their, to get their cake while eating it too. They claim both of Freud's primal drives, death and eros, without bothering about the lack of mutuality between them, which bedeviled Freud. Here is a sign that the fantasy is closed in on itself. Going back to our movie, in Edge of Tomorrow, Major Cage gets to die without dying. In totalitarianism, subjects, subjects get to kill with impunity. They get to kill without being limited by any of the traditional limits on killing, whether uh, they be religious, political, or commonsensical. Arendt points out that the efforts connected to the concentration camps in the last few years of World War II were, were clearly ruining any chance that the Nazis might actually win the war. So they're following their own idea to their own demise. But in both cases, the film and uh, these regimes, the fantasy more or less completely occludes anxiety. And yet, as Arendt notes, one happy feature of totalitarian governments is that perhaps because of the circularity of their logic, they always end up consuming themselves. It was no secret that once the Jews were taken care of, the next target was inferior Germans. In the totalitarianism of the Soviet Union under Stalin, this tendency towards self-devouring was even clearer, according to Arendt. And the terror more omnipresent, as it happened again and again, that those most clearly in seats of power succumbed to the grinding gears of the idea just as quickly as anyone. In fact, terror is another of the crucial characteristics of the totalitarian fantasy. For those on the inside of the fantasy, anxiety has gone away. But for those on the outside, and there's always an outside, the experience is only pure terror. What the Bolsheviks did so well, and perhaps Stalin was the absolute master, was to make sure that everyone, except the man in the center of the regime, you might say the Omega, feels the danger of that terror and is therefore all the more likely to inform on neighbors and spouses in order to stay on the right side of the fantasy. It seems to me that only psychoanalysis has placed sufficient weight on this fantasy in its centrality in the life of the psyche to explain the bewildering lack of resistance in totalitarian um, regimes. The subject does not resist because to resist would be to suffer the full terror not of an external agent, police or military, but of their own death drive. Part of the logic of this terror was to, in Arendt's words, squeeze people into a mass, to deprive them of their public space, which in her philosophy means to take away their freedom, because freedom is only possible in a public space where men and women can meet each other as equals. It is this public space in which we are free to legislate our own fate that Arendt emphasizes in the American Revolution. So, in contrast to the French Revolution, in which the poor uh, become a mass squeezed together and directed by a general will, this concept of Rousseau, a situation which inevitably calls up a single figure, the first being Napoleon, to give direction to this amorphous mass. And of course, the 
terror that paves the way to this. Um, in France, the social contract was between the mass of people and a tyrannical general will, which was in a rents telling modeled on the monarch and uh, is sort of able to incarnate a figure like Napoleon. <coughs> the social contract for the Americans was between the people themselves, who were equals and who were equals in a public space where they could legislate for themselves. So this gets back to de Tocqueville and his sort of amazement at the number of associations and little groups that all Americans seem to be a part of. He said, look, this capacity for contract making, for making covenants, clearly seems to be a part of the American DNA. And she accepts that argument. Um, so this social contract between people as opposed between the people and a, another thing uh, that represents authority is for rent the only authority needed to found the nation in a constitution of freedom. And she explains the strange uh, enduring ability of our constitution to be rooted there in the sort of um, simple fact of people doing something new together in this public space of freedom. Um, so, in my opinion, or at least I'm throwing it out there, mm -hmm. Arendt and Lacan seem to converge on the notion of freedom. The Lacanian subject has freedom precisely to the extent uh, that it's left perpetually unsatisfied. Or the Arendtian political subject is free precisely to the extent that there is a minimal distance from one of the basic goals of political de deliberation, namely security. And this brings us to the objet a of the American political landscape, which in Arendt's reading, well, she doesn't use the term objet a, but the thing that it drops out after the founding of the republic is enjoyment in politics. And I realize this is a tremendous oxymoron. Um, it's impossible, I think, for us to imagine that anyone could enjoy politics. At best, it's a duty that some brave souls are willing to take on. A duty that we grudgingly perform every four years when we go to the polls. And the fact that I think I only, you know, I only go to every four years proves my point. <laughs> um, at worst, it's a theater of scandal and corruption attracting rogues and charlatans. And you know, even when a TV show or a film, something like uh, House of Cards, um, depicts an engaged political actor, this enjoyment is often pathological. They do it because they need the adulation, because they are addicted to the power and the fame. And I think this is essentially how we think of political actors, even when we respect them. We, we, we assume that there is some sort of pathological need for praise and, and adulation. And yet, Arendt emphasizes the bliss and enjoyment of men like um, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, and she, she has these quotes that I think sound very strange about how much they enjoyed the work they did. And so I'll give a couple of them. This is Jefferson to Adams. You know, they wrote these letters to each other at the end of their lives. Um, uh, Jefferson says, May we meet there again in Congress with our ancient colleagues and receive with them the seal of approbation. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Mm -hmm. They're very old, of course. They're, they're thinking of their deaths. And Arendt says, commenting on this, Here we have the admission that life in Congress... The joys of discourse and legislation were to Jefferson no less a foretaste of the eternal bliss to come than the delights of contemplation had been for medieval piety. And you know, as a philosopher, this is, this is her point of interest, right? It flips the tradition which has always said that um, the only joys in this world that are worth talking about, that have any bearing on eternity, are those of contemplation, of seeing God communing with God. And then she also quotes John Adams who says, uh, referring to the same work of legislating and discourse and all this, that it is, it is action and not rest that constitutes our pleasure. And that also flips the tradition. It's not the Sabbath that is pleasurable, it's all the work. And so heaven for them is hashing out another bill. Mm -hmm. May we be saved from such a heaven. <laughs> but for a rent, you know, that's a problem that we can't even really conceptualize that kind of enjoyment. Um, 
these men, these founding fathers, knew that they were engaging in political activity that was risky, foolhardy, absurd in ways, and at a certain point it must have dawned on them that despite all the classical models they obsessively attempted to follow, you know, they more or less walked around in togas, they were about to birth something completely new. And yet, what we get from them is not a sense of anxiety, especially in these letters which she, um, which she focuses on, or being lost at sea, despite their lack of security in their position, but of the bliss of joining together as equals to determine the shape of their fate to lay down a constitution of freedom, which they had the audacity to consider as something that would last for generations. It is this which has dropped out from our political experience, and the proof of it, such as it is, is that, is that instead of that primordial enjoyment, we have an unavoidable dichotomy, or the many dichotomies of our political experience. So when we think about politics, we only think about the left, right, conservative, liberal. Um, we have no other way to approach it. These are like, uh, you know, uh, cherubims with flaming swords blocking the way to um, the kind of joy that Adams and Jefferson seem to revel in. For Arendt, there is also a phrase that gets lost in the loss of enjoyment uh, in politics. And uh, Lacan would like this, I think. I don't know if he read Arendt, but he would say, yes, the signifier gets, gets lost as well. And the phrase is public happiness. And Arendt thinks that looking at um, Jefferson before he wrote the Declaration of Independence, that there was some confusion as to whether it should be the pursuit of happiness or the pursuit of public happiness, namely whether happiness was private or public. Um, and Arendt says, and I think she's right, that clearly we have opted for the private reading. So what replaces the public happiness becomes the pursuit of happiness, which is essentially pursuit of private happiness. And another way to look at it is to see the public happiness dropping out and getting the duality of uh, security versus, uh, or, or sort of next to, related to this um, private happiness. The situation in which we think of politics as protecting the private happiness or the private wealth that one earns uh, on one's own outside of the public sphere. So maybe to cast light on this to make it uh, a little more clear, we remember in the in the fairy tale, Jack and the Beanstalk, that when Obje Ah, the breast slash cow, <coughs> drops out, we're presented with a duality. This is also in the Garden of Eden, right? When the tree of life drops out, we get the tree of duality, tree of good and evil, which is a tree of good versus evil, which is also a tree of good, uh, of, of life versus death. So too in the American political experience, we not only get the dualities of left and right, but we also get the duality of private happiness and the security which it needs. Um, and this seems to map on pretty well to the coins and the beans, which I talked about earlier. These coins of wealth and these uh, seemingly worthless beans that ultimately provide the security of endless wealth. But one shouldn't do politics as if it were a fairy tale. So, um, to kind of recap what we've learned today, if we've learned anything, something to take away. Um, with Tillich, we get this message of anxiety as being here to stay. He says it's there in the ancient world, the medieval world, the modern world. We simply deal with it differently. The important thing in terms of uh, the courage to be is the courage to face anxiety. We ought not to turn objects of fear, uh, I'm sorry, objects of anxiety into objects of fear. And I think you see this come up. I mean, for me, uh, this news about the um, this news about the airliner that crashed a couple days ago, and you know, we just heard the news. I think this morning or last night that it seems to be that the the, the co-pilot locked the pilot out of the cockpit and took the plane down with complete calm for no seeming reason. And I was listening to the report, and I had the moment of a great anxiety when they talked about how, you know, in the black box recording, which records everything that goes on in the cockpit, you could hear him breathing regularly until impact. There's no, there was no tension, no fear, 
Um, and as the report went on, I was able to relieve my anxiety because they told me that, well, he seems completely normal, painfully normal, and yet there was a week during training that he had to take off because he um, had some stress or he had some depression. And I thought, oh, he must have gone to train, to train with Al-Qaeda. There must be a reason, <laughs> right? That is an absurd thing to think. I don't think this is true. Um, perhaps there's some link with his uh, depression or stress. But I was desperately searching to turn this object of anxiety, a man who could take a plane down without um, adjusting his breathing, <laughs> whose heart rate didn't get any higher as he took the lives of himself and 150 people, uh, trying to replace that object of anxiety with an object of fear. Give me something I can fear, Al-Qaeda, I know we can beat them, we can go find them, we can kill them, root them out, find their holes, whatever, all that stuff, you know. Um, but that's a danger, I think, for Tillich, and he sort of gives you this sense of um, watch out for that tendency. Lacan says, and I think not completely disagreeing with Tillich, that anxiety is not without its object. It's not without its object. The object of anxiety is objet a. And in the psychoanalytic setting, to follow the trail of anxiety, to work through one's fundamental fantasy, to grapple with objet a, is to achieve a minimal distance from your anxiety, which is the space of desire. So Lacan also says, work with anxiety, get some distance from it. Um, and a rent, I think, allows us to interrogate our collective political fantasy, um, in which we foreclose on both enjoyment and anxiety by interpreting freedom as private instead of understanding the goal of governance as the maintenance of this public space of freedom, which she talks about so much. We've interpreted pursuit of happiness in solely private terms, and we've reaped the benefits of, of, of wealth and security. But what if freedom is something much closer to Lacan's desire? Some breathing room from the admittedly valuable goal of public security. What if we could think about these lost public spaces of freedom where the enjoyment of excelling, of persuading, of legislating and judging were allowed to exist there with their attendant anxieties? What if we were to look for ways to break open the fantasy of perfect security that occludes both anxiety and enjoyment. So I, I've said that Groundhog Day is a, is a much better film than Edge of Tomorrow. I don't think anyone's going to take me to task on this. Um, but it's not just because it came first with this idea of the repeating day, but because in contradistinction to Edge of Tomorrow, where despite a lifting of the fantasy for a brief moment, our hero never seriously has to bear responsibility for his actions, in the, in the face of a death that is real. In distinction to that, in Groundhog Day, the Bill Murray character, he comes to despair not because he will one day die, but because he can no longer die. After a few fun death scenes, he loses the enjoyment of death. It's only, it's only when he lives as if he's going to die, while he still holds the power of immortality, that he's finally able to break the spell of the repeating day and wake up in tomorrow. And yes, he gets the girl at the end of the film, but only after we've seen him clearly work through his fantasy of this girl. And he gets her and some distance from his fantasy at the same moment. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Questions or comments?